Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Dark Dive, the podcast that delves into the depths of the dark web. My name is Aidan Murphy, and I'm your host as each episode we look at different aspects of the dark web. In the podcast feed, you can already find the entire limited series. In other episodes, we look at how the dark web works, and we look at other areas of the dark web, like marketplaces and ransomware leak sites. But in this episode, we're going to look at dark web forums, the place where criminals go to talk to each other, sharing tips, news, and collaborating with one another. To discuss this topic, I'm joined by two individuals who spend their time trawling through the contents of dark web forums. Vlad, a threat intelligence analyst at Searchlight Cyber. Hello, Vlad. Hello, Aidan. Hello, everyone. And Joe Honey, one of Searchlight Cyber's threat intelligence engineers. Hello, Joe. Hi, Aidan. Hi, guys. Great. Before we jump in, can I just start each of you to maybe give a quick overview of a role to listeners? Uh, we'll start with you, Vlad. What does it mean to be a threat intelligence analyst? What, what does your day-to-day look like? Well, I'm responsible for monitoring cyber criminal activity on underground forums, marketplaces, instant communication platforms, basically anywhere that uh, threat actors may interact with each other, as well as uh, maintaining and ensuring elevated access on closed sources, analyzing and researching threat actor behavior and so on and so forth. Basically, anything that involves movements by threat actors of any kind. Brilliant. Well, you sound like the right person to talk to for this particular episode, and we're going to talk about what that means in a minute. And Joe, uh, what does it mean to be a threat intelligence engineer? How, how does that, I guess, differ, differ from Vlad's day-to-day? Thanks, Aidan. So my role differs from Vlad in that it's very much more sales-focused. So I specialize working with our customers, helping them get the best from our tools and our data. So a large part of that is technical. Yeah, what do our tools do? How do they work? How do customers use them? But a massive part is understanding, you know, what criminals are doing on the dark web, how they're doing it, where they're doing it, why they're doing that, and then translating that into a format that our customers can use and kind of guide their searches, ultimately making sure they get what they want out of our tools and our data. So this episode, we're going to look at dark web forums. Our listeners may have listened to our last episode on dark web marketplaces And I think many will be familiar with the idea of internet forums, the likes of Reddit. A good place to start maybe is how dark web forums differ from the forums that you might find on the clear web. Vlad, what's different between dark web forums and clear web forums? Of course, in terms of structure, there isn't that much of a difference. To be honest, it's basically the same thing. I wouldn't compare it to Reddit, apart from Dread, which is a bit of a different kind of cybercrime board. But most of the forums, they actually resemble regular forums that you see with car enthusiasts and well, arts people and so on. Why am I saying this is basically because they're, they're, every forum is structured into a few categories, usually a marketplace, learning and knowledge part, and everyone gets to, to click on their specific topic, topic and they can go on from that point and basically interact with, uh, with other forum members who have similar interests those interests vary quite a lot so it's it's a very similar place it's a very similar structure only the topics are a bit more illegal sometimes most of the time but yeah in 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 large it's basically the same thing it works on the same in the same way it's just a different topic interesting so i i guess that's quite helpful for the listener so you could, if you if you know what an internet forum looks like you can you can imagine a dark web forum but the content is different joe what what type of things do people talk about on dark web forums that maybe they don't talk about on regular forums or do? Is, is there a crossover? Absolutely everything gets discussed on the dark web, really. I mean, as Vlad's kind of hinted to, probably the majority of content on dark web forums is illegal or, or shady in some shape or form. Everything from, you know, this particular piece of malware, how do I buy it, access it, use it? I've got this particular item or piece of data to trade. You know, everything kind of illegal is discussed on onto the dark web. But equally as well, there is a lot of what could be called normal content on dark web forums. There is people sharing news stories and you know discussions about you know current politics and things like that. Even I was looking this morning and stumbled across a thread dedicated to a dog which had passed away. But the dog was thirty years old and there was this massive outpouring of support. So yeah, on the whole, these forums are quite dark places to hang around, but you do get odd little sort of funny moments and, and sort of moments of light and, and good humour and so on. Why do you think people use dark web forums instead of clear web forums then? It, is it a privacy thing or is it because they want to talk about things that typically would be frowned upon or maybe even illegal on the clear web? 
I would say it's just because they know that on those specific forums, they're going to get an answer for their question because uh, those people that also join the forums have common interests. So it's, it, it makes sense to just go on to the dark web forums, dark web forums, just because you know that there's someone there who has similar interests as you and they, you might get an, an actual useful, useful uh, answer while as, asking the same question on a regular forum might not lead you anywhere because there, there, there aren't similar people over there. But uh, there, are, there is no, this, there's no simple answer to this question. It's just a matter of choice for everyone. There's a lot of uh, factors that uh, might uh, change this. For example, in some countries, there are uh, some uh, laws that prohibit people from uh, well, using normal forums, countries like Iran and so on. So they, they, they are forced to go onto the dark web to ask questions that may not be seen as legal. So there are, there are plenty of factors out there. I think one of the other things for me, I mean, you know, if you're after illegal content, the dark, yeah, the dark web is the place to go. But I think one of the other attractive paths to a dark web forum is the fact that they are anonymous. You know, the internet is generally anonymous. anonymous. You, know, you can you know, de-anonymize people and work out who they are and so on. But the dark web is even more anonymous than that. And because of that perceived anonymity, you know, people feel a lot freer to be who they want to be, look for what they want to look for, talk about what they want to do, share opinions that would be problematic elsewhere. I think that kind of it enables people to be you know, the version of themselves they want to be almost. That's really interesting. So the sense I'm getting from both of you is almost it's about this kind of community feel, finding like-minded people, having the ability to speak freely, which actually isn't something I'd considered before. That is a really fascinating topic in itself. If, if people want to find out a little bit more about how the dark web is, is more anonymous than the clear web. We have a, a separate episode on that the first episode in the series, so we won't go into too much depth on that now, uh, but it's a really good point, Joe. You've mentioned one of the forums, Dread, Vlad. Are there any other, I guess, noteworthy forums, you know, the, the most kind of infamous or famous forums on the dark web that, that people should know about if they're listening? It really depends on the type of activity you're looking to get yourself into. But uh, usually with cybercrime, the most used at the moment in terms of uh, uh, English language forums is Bridge, Bridge Forums. It's a reincarnation of Right Forums, which was taken down a couple of years ago, which then morphed into Bridge Forums, which then morphed again into another Bridge Forums because the first, uh, the first uh, version was uh, taken offline for a bit as the admin was arrested. But now it still lingers on. It's still it's still here. Uh, it accepts uh, new new accounts and so on. In terms of topics that are discussed over there, it's very widespread. So there's no specific uh, thing that you have to talk about. You'll see their initial access brokers. You'll see their database vendors. You'll see uh, fraud and financial related scams and so on, as well as a really large uh, knowledge and learning. It's also considered a large knowledge and learning platform because there's a specific sub uh, section of the forum where people just discuss on how to do things and how what's the newest uh, method of designing and coding this specific malware and so on. While going uh, away from the English language uh, area, we of course have to think about the Russian because the Russian language is widely used in this uh, uh, in, uh, in cybercrime. The most well-known forums at the moment are Exploit and XSS, which are they consider themselves to be brothers in terms of, uh, I mean, the admins probably know each other and they've been uh, partners in a way or another for the past um, almost 20 years because the uh, first signs of these forums appeared in about, I think, 2005, 2006. So it's, it's, they've been out there for, for, quite, for quite well. There are plenty of other forums, but these three, they are the trifecta of forums. There's a... Others that popped up a bit more recently, like Ramp, which appeared in the couple a couple years ago. What's different about Ramp is that it widely accepts ransomware discussions, while uh, Exploit and XSS uh, actually banned this to make sure that they're not targeted by law enforcement uh, that much. And of course, there are plenty plenty of others. It, it really depends on uh, on who's joining and what they want to to, to find on on those forums. You've opened up a whole can of worms of things that I want to talk about. But one one thing that I did just want to pull out very quickly or, or just highlight maybe for the listener. So you mentioned that Exploit and XSS have been around almost for 20 years now. In our Marketplace podcast, we were talking about 
how these marketplaces struggle really to stay around for a couple of years. Louise was talking about how we, we kind of think of marketplaces in terms of months at a time and uh, longevity for our marketplaces, maybe two or three years. You know, that's a that's a pretty good run. Do either of you, I guess, have a sense of why these hacking forums are able to stay operational for much longer? How, how do they avoid being, I guess, taken down by law enforcement? Is it because what they're doing is... is less criminal or are they just better at getting away with it? I think as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, the forums are seen as a com community rather than a money-making platform. And there's, they seem to be a bit more accepted by law enforcement in some areas, while the marketplaces are they're just full of uh, illegal stuff, uh, illegal selling of drugs and uh, weapons and counterfeit uh, devices and jewelry and so on. So it, I think it's just a matter of how they are viewed. In in essence, they're basically both both categories are illegal. But I don't know. I think the fact that the forums are a bit more gray, I would say they. I wouldn't say they're white because they are definitely are not white hat. But there's there's other things happening apart from the illegal stuff. Also, the admins are not there necessarily for a for a profit, as uh, it often happens with uh, the marketplace admins which we've probably, you've probably discussed about this, the, some of them exit scam and so on. While uh, the admins of uh, cybercrime forums, they're there for the community, they're there for their reputation, they just want to make sure they, they keep the community living and alive and so on. That's how I see things. Maybe Joe has another view. No, I think kind of very similar. I think for me, there's kind of a couple of main points. I mean, yeah, firstly, on forums, there is a lot of not illegal content you know I, I wouldn't necessarily call it legitimate you know if i was to sit and have a conversation with vlad about how to hack into a particular system and the methods i would use that in itself isn't illegal me going to do it is absolutely but me just talking about writing code is is perfectly fine so because of that you know the the proportion of illegal content on there is is much lower possibly i think it's probably part of it that where a lot of these forums are cybercrime focused a lot of the the admins and so on take a lot more pains around, you know, their own operational security, keeping things safe and secure, and and yeah, looking after themselves. Whereas if you're on a market, you know, if you're you're a drug dealer, you're kind of a drug dealer first and on the dark web second, if that makes sense. So you're likely to be less knowledgeable, perhaps, in the area. You know, I don't, can't have any sources for this, so I can't kind of quote it. But I wonder almost if there's an element of kind of a resourcing challenge as well. You know, if you're law enforcement and you've got the resources to target and take down one dark web community, are you going to go for the forums where there's some bad stuff, but also lots of not illegal stuff? Or are you going to go for the market where the vast majority of it is you know, illegal goods, drugs, guns, whatever it may be? You're going to get more return on investment, more bang for your buck by taking down that marketplace than you would do the forum. Unfortunately, with the resourcing challenges most law enforcement departments face, they've got to go for where the value is. That makes a lot of sense, Joe. One thing I just wanted to to come in on was was that operational security point. Um, it's a interesting term, and it's not one I'd heard of before I started working here at Search Like Cyber. Maybe you could just explain for the listener what operational security is. Yeah, OPSEC, operational security, is a term that initially was started to be used by kind of the military and kind of the intelligence community, though those types of people. Essentially, operational security is about the measures that you take to ensure the security of you, yourself, your operation. Let's say you're a spy, you know, trying to go into Russia or something like that. You're not going to use your own passport. You're going to have a cover identity. You're going to use burner phones. Basically, all things to enable you to try and stay anonymous and, and essentially to stay safe and to achieve your goals, whatever they are. The exact same thing applies in the dark web. I wanted to add something uh, regarding OPSEC is that OPSEC is extremely important when maintaining and operating uh, marketplaces or forums and so on. This leads me to uh, in a, in a recent example with someone named Connor Fitzpatrick, who was the admin of Bridge Forums in his first version. His alias on the forum was Pompom Purin. And he was actually found and arrested because he used one of his real email addresses. So that that was a huge, huge, huge OPSEC uh, flaw that he, I don't know why, I'm really not sure how this happened with such an experienced uh, threat actor, but it happens to the best of us. And it also takes me back to our previous question 
uh, on why forums linger on much longer than uh, than marketplaces. The audience needs to understand that it uh, it's not because law enforcement doesn't target and doesn't focus on both of them. There's less stuff changing hands. Yeah, there isn't physical goods changing hands. There isn't money changing hands, and because of that, there's there's essentially less stuff to track on a forum versus a marketplace. Obviously, the less stuff there is to track, the less opportunities you know, law enforcement has to you know work out who you are in the real life and obviously come and knock on your door and, and say hello. I think breach forums is an interesting example as well because as you mentioned, Vlad, it's kind of already gone through a, diff- a couple of different iterations and uh, at times felt like it was gone for good uh, and then and then returned. So after Connor Fitzpatrick was it was was, was arrested. The breach forums has continued with with new uh, not new administrators but other administrators effectively just taking the reins and continuing the forum. One thing I just wanted to I guess bring up at this point for the benefit of our listeners, it is worth saying that some of the forums we're talking about don't only exist on the dark web, uh, and some of them exist just on the clear web and deep web. I wondered if Vlad, you could maybe break that down for the listeners. If these some of these forums are existing on the clear web or deep web. Are there any kind of barriers to stop regular people like me just accidentally wandering onto them or again, security professionals or law enforcement? There is absolutely no barrier, especially with uh, free forums like uh, bridge forums. Anyone can join. You can. There's plenty of discussions about it on popular places like Reddit. There are some forums who have a few other verification methods. Some of them require, for example, on RAM forums, you have two ways of creating an account, creating an account. One of them is by paying $500 to, to the admins via Bitcoin, while the second one is to provide proof that you're reputable on a secondary forum like Exploit or XSS. And if you are reputable on those forums, so you can uh, get the account for free. But of course, this isn't for everyone. No, this is a, a way for the admin to ensure that Whoever is joining the forum is knowledgeable of hacking and not just everyone who's just heard of about hacking for the first time today can can get in there. And it's also a method of, a method of uh, securing the forum against scammers. But uh, yeah, in large, with uh, quite, quite a large number of forums, it's free for everyone to join. It's easy to get in there. It's just the similar way of creating an account as you would create an account on Amazon or any other well-known and reputable platform out there. I think on the topic of like technical barriers and challenges, the the dark web has this like aura of being this really mysterious, hard to access thing. It, it's not. You know, the main kind of technical barrier is just working out kind of where to go. You know, there isn't a Google for the dark web. There isn't a site index. So you have to know the address for breach forums, for example, to access it. And addresses on the dark web, they're not what you'd expect. They're not what you used to on the clear web. There's just 56 random characters thrown together. So... That's the only technical barrier is just working out where to go. Accessing the dark web itself and the sites is, is very easy. We also have to mention that uh, most of these forums, quite a lot of them, not all of them, but quite a lot of them, also have a surface, a service web address, a regular one. This, as I was saying earlier, you can just go into British forums. You, you don't need the Onion link. You can use the, the surface link. Same with XSS, same with Exploit, same with Trump. So the most well-known forums out there also have a surface web option for, for those who don't want to bother with Tor. Would it be right in thinking that the ones that do require this kind of extra authentication, so you mentioned Trump requiring a fee or proving that you have credibility on another forum, is there, I guess, a hierarchy of forums in terms of more serious cyber criminal activity on those forums you would expect more I guess, serious crime or more sophisticated hackers? Is, is that the right way of looking at it? We could say that. Uh, from my experience on the forums, I think those forums that are somewhat open uh, to, to everyone to join, even if, if they have a, a fee that you have to pay, ramp and exploit are probably considered to be the most serious ones at the moment. There's a good balance between quantity of quality of uh, threat actors. XSS also quite similar. There were forums in the past who aren't that used anymore. They kind of died down. They're still active, but there is a match activity where even if you wanted to join, you'd have to pass an interview with the admin who would personally ask you questions. And this is a good example of uh, the Kikas forum. 
yeah, I mean, it's way past its prime at the moment, but the, the admin over there, the, he, he asked you questions in person. You had to pass the interview. Also, you had to remain active on the forum. That was probably considered a serious, uh, so, or, or you wanted to be considered a serious forum at, at the time, but it didn't go that well because it was too strict for a lot of actors. But free forums like Bridge, yeah, I'll see a larger number of scammers. They're easily bannable by the admins, but it's it's a game of cat and mice. So you have to to pay attention if you want to, to purchase anything from there. I imagine if you're a actor concerned about your opsec doing a, a an interview to get onto a forum, may may go counter to your. Uh sensibilities that I could I could imagine that may have been off-putting to some people just before I come to you Joe to maybe talk a little bit more about what's on these forums Vlad just just one more question on the differences between the levels of the forums is there a divide between these Russian forums you mentioned like XSS and exploit and the English language speaking forums or again is there is there a lot of crossover between them there is a huge crossover. Uh, when I'm saying Russian speaking forum, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily speaking Russian only. It's tailored to Russians, the admins are Russian, but there are a lot of English speakers out there who want to join them, who want to have a more mature and a more serious audience, who even if they are English speakers, they prefer to use the, that forums. They usually don't have an issue with that. You can post freely in, in English. So the, I think there is a huge crossover between them. Also, I've seen actors moving on from Russian speaking forums onto English speaking forums. So the, the language barrier isn't that much of a problem apart from communication sometimes, but uh, in terms of sales and business, you're, you're free to join it everywhere. Probably the Chinese forums are a bit more strict in that regards. There's a more definite world between Chinese forums and the Russian and English ones. But apart from that, no, I wouldn't say there's a there's any divide between uh, between them. That's interesting. Are there, are there any examples of Chinese forums? Um, I, it's not something I've come across before. Uh, there is DibMix. It's a bit more difficult to get into if you're not speaking Chinese, but it's still active. There's quite a few others which I cannot pronounce the, their names because I don't really speak Chinese. But uh, also, I've noticed something interesting on the RAM forum recently. I mean, over the past year, uh, they've translated some of their sections to Chinese as well to Mandarin. But they, they basically wanted to attract actors from that region. It works roughly. There, there are some actors active over there who speak Chinese, but that that's not that much of an audience. But it happens. It's the first first time I'm I'm seeing this. It speaks, I guess, to the international nature of the, the hacking scene. Was there something you wanted to add on that, on that, Joe? Yeah, I mean, I almost wonder, Vlad, if we can almost like draw a parallel between like mainstream social media and, you know, forums and stuff on the dark web. So if you look at, you know, the clear website, you've got Facebook, you've got Twitter, you've got Instagram. They are, you know, your big boys, your main players. You know, pretty much every concept piece of content either starts on Facebook or, you know, starts somewhere else and ends up on Facebook at one particular point. And I think it's kind of quite similar for the dark web. You know, you have your XSS, your exploit, reach forums and so on, which are popular and, and most people have accounts on. But for every Facebook, there's what five, ten smaller niche communities or more where, you know, things are discussed and, and sort of nuggets of gold, you know, from an intelligence point of view end up. And and they sort of change places all the time. And, you know, if you look at how Facebook dethroned MySpace kind of many years ago, you know, similar things happen on the dark web. Sometimes it's it's kind of a very, very quick, kind of quite rapid change, and, and others it's it's much slower. We also have to take into account the fact that in, in this scenario, we're speaking about business. So if someone wants to sell something and if they cannot find the right buyer in their area, they'll have to look for other markets to, to go into. So I'm thinking that uh, even actors from, from, from China or Chinese-speaking uh, regions who cannot find the right person to sell to on Dimmings or on Chang An, which is another Chinese forum, they will look for other places to, to do so. Or maybe they obtain access to some Chinese government uh, institution, which they, will, they wouldn't want to sell that on the Chinese uh, forum because they would be afraid of repercussions from law enforcement. So there are plenty of reasons for actors to spread their wings far and wide. Of course, they want to, to sell uh, their product 
And if the only way to do so is abroad, then they'll do so. This leads me on beautifully to what, something I was about to ask about, which I guess is the activity that goes on on these forums. So you mentioned before, Vlad, that there's a lot of kind of information sharing, education, learning new skills. But you, you have just mentioned there is a business element to this and, and something that we see a lot is initial access brokers. I wonder, Joe, maybe if you can explain what an initial access broker is and how they operate. Yeah, of course. So an initial access broker, it's probably just a posh title for a specialized hacker. And what they specialize in is that very first part of an attack on the business. So if you consider you know, a cyber attack on a business, it all starts with someone getting a foothold into that organization, essentially kind of walking through the front door. You would then wander in, have a round, understand, you know, what is inside this computer, you know, this computer network, what's inside the organization. And then you would take some sort of action. You know, you would take that data for yourselves. If you're a ransomware group, you would probably do that and encrypt all of their data and all their systems as well. What initial access brokers do is they specialize just in that very first part of that chain. So finding a business that has a vulnerability, a technical weakness in their infrastructure, they will exploit that and gain a foothold inside their systems. They'll typically do a little bit of work past this. Yeah, they'll do a bit of enumeration to try and understand what potential assets are there. Quite commonly, we see things like how many computers are on the network, what systems are they running, what security tools are they running. Essentially, they'll they will take that, they will package up that access and the initial information that they've got about this victim, and then they will try and sell that on the dark web. And typically, depending on the size of the company and you know the, the value of the data there, those accesses go, could go for twenty, fifty dollars, something like that. Could go for tens of thousands of dollars, depending on you know the potential um, benefit from an actual hacker hacker sort of doing that. So they'll they'll take just that very first part of that attack chain, that sort of access. They'll sell that to the highest broker, and typically they do that on forums because sort of forums are much better suited to that product compared to a marketplace. If you consider a marketplace to be like Amazon, you know, you go on, I want 10 whatevers. So Amazon is, is perfect for that. You go in, you place your order, you make your payment, your goods are shipped. If you're trying to buy an access, it's not as black and white. You know, who are you going to hack in the end? What is there? What do I potentially need to know to do that? Do I want to spend my $10,000 up front to potentially get a million dollars when I successfully ransom the business, for example? So because of that back and forward nature and, and kind of the questions that often happen, they tend to sit more on forums rather than marketplaces. So the way, where we see this then on the forums is effectively as an advert, or at least that's how I think of them. They advertise this access and then you typically see other forum members interacting with it. Like you say, Joe, maybe asking questions or bidding because effectively they're often done as auctions. I guess the tricky thing about this is they probably can't give away too much information because it would let the organization know that they're being targeted. What type of information does the typical initial access broker provide to let the buyer know or give an indication of, of, of what they're getting? Yeah, you're exactly right. It's a fine line to walk. You know, They want to share as much as possible to kind of showcase that they've got a valuable product. You know, they want to drive that bidding. They want to get it sold at the end of the day. But if they share too much, you know, another hacker will go and just abuse that access. They'll target that same business, um, or you know, exactly right. The customer, you know, the end customer, the victim will sort of patch that particular vulnerability. I mean, what we typically see on sort of initial access broker posts. So we typically see the industry that the organisation is is part of. We typically see details around turnover um, and the numbers of computers and so on that's on the network. We quite often see what kind of systems are in use. You know, what operating systems. What level of access has you know has that access sort of got? Yeah, you know, if there's an antivirus or something, they'll kind of try and put that there as well. I mean, a lot of the information that these kind of access brokers share is just taken straight from sites like Zoom Info. You know, they'll put in search like cyber in there. They'll see that we're a software company. We're based in the UK. We've got X number of employees, X amount of turnover. I've I've seen they even just copy and paste the output from Zoom Info and pop pop it into that sort of access broker post. There is a few people out there who go to a lot more depth. Um, there's a couple of very brazen access brokers. Maybe one escapes me now. He attacked a university a couple of years ago, but he has kind of been sort of that big. He's that well established that he's very happy to just share the names and, and sort of domains of the organizations that he's targeted. There's a real mix, but I mean, on the whole, it's 
as little information as they can get away with, but still conveying the kind of size of the organization. Vlad, I know you spend quite a lot of time tracking down these initial access broker posts from a security perspective. So looking at this from, from maybe our audience of security professionals, what can they learn from these posts and, and how useful is it that, that we can see them on the other side, I guess? Well, I think it's uh, monitoring those initial access sales is quite relevant. As Joe said, they, they provide a lot of very useful information. Sometimes actors, they actually provide too much information, which would allow any security team out there, any member of the IT department who knows their way around their network to actually identify how the actor got there. They can actually identify if they are the victim or not. So. It's extremely relevant, and I'm saying this because we've seen actors providing so much detail about the companies that the actual company was able to identify themselves. They identified the door that was accessed to get into their systems, and they secured their network before anything was just happening. But this is, of course, it comes down to was the actor, the initial access broker, careful enough to not provide enough information, or did he provide... Sometimes I would, I've noticed that actors, they do not provide that much information on the, uh, on the initial seller uh, access thread, but if security researcher would try to get into direct contact with, uh, with the actor, which of course, by using human intelligence uh, methods, you can get some more info from the actor by speaking to him directly, asking for proof of concept, which often comes in, uh, the form of screenshots or videos from the network. There's plenty of information to, to source from, from the actors, which may help you uh, protect your network before any kind of attack happening. So this is, this is basically the pre, pre attack surface. It's just, you have to make sure that you monitor all these forums and monitor the, the relevant initial access brokers, because you never know when you're the, the next victim. I think it's possibly worth adding as well, Vlad. You know, if you consider like the lifestyle, sorry, the life cycle of a cyber attack. You know, you look at the Lockheed Martin model from reconnaissance and weaponization through to command and control and actions on objectives. A lot of security setups. I mean, if the hacker is careful, you know, they may not get noticed until you know that bad action is actually taken. You know, that malware is deployed, that ransomware starts encrypting your systems. The initial access broker post it sits around that you know exploitation that installation sort of type level there so it's it's much earlier at that kill chain so if you can identify you know you being attacked much earlier in that kill chain it's going to be quicker it's going to be cheaper it's going to be easier for you to fix that particular problem that particular vulnerability rather than waiting for all of that bad news where you know the ransomware is detonated and you know the many millions in ransoms and downtime and, and negative media exposure and so on. Yeah, so I guess this is an opportunity really for security professionals because of the initial access broker model. There's a point where effectively they have to communicate externally. And even if they're doing it on these forums that have a degree of anonymity, have a degree maybe of, of barriers to entry, like you said at the beginning, Vlad, they're pretty accessible really. So there, there is an opportunity for security professionals to, to gather this, this information. And like you say, Joe, act a little bit earlier. Vlad, you look at the profile of these initial access brokers as well. It, it's a game of reputation, right? So often they sell access to multiple organizations or, and, and they kind of build up this credibility over time. It's, it's very rarely just a kind of one, one and done situation. Is that right? It really depends on the actor. We've seen actors who take OPSEC really, really seriously. They create a new account for their, uh, for each of their sales. Uh, but there are actors out there who have been active for the past seven or 10 years. So it, there isn't a definite answer for that. Some actors prefer to just use one account. They gain a reputation over time and they can charge more and more money because uh, if they get reputa reputable and they have confirmed sales on the forum, they will be seen as trustworthy and uh, buyers can will be will feel free to contact them and, uh, and buy from them without being scared of being scammed. Even with new actors, in, in the last few years, the forums became a bit more secure. They've, uh, most of the reputable forums have an escrow or middleman service, which basically guarantees that uh, what you're paying for, you actually get. 
because this middleman basically acts as in he's going to the middleman usually is the forum admin or another reputable person from uh, from the forum and this uh, middleman will hold your money and will get the product from the actor basically being a third a third wheel over there he will make sure that the product is right and when he confirms the product is right he will exchange the product with the money, basically giving the money to the uh, seller and giving the product to you. In, of course, in exchange of a percentage. But this way, uh, you wouldn't have to, to to pay the money up front and eventually get scammed. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So that's that's one type of activity that goes on, initial access brokers. Obviously, we, we talked about the ed- education and sharing of kind of techniques we we did mention ransomware. I guess it might be quite surprising to listeners. It was surprising to me that there are these hacking forums where the ransomware is a, is a banned topic, uh, as you mentioned, Vlad. But there are some ransomware groups that you that do use forums. How, how exactly does that work? They generally use the forums for communication and discussing things, discussing about their plans, discussing about uh, all sorts of stuff. But they're not actively actively recruiting from the forum. They're not uh, looking for affiliates. They're not advertising their uh, their actual product. For example, Logbit. The Logbit support is quite active on XSS. They they have thousands of reputation points, but they're not actively recruiting over there. At least not since uh, the ransomware topic has been banned. Similar, they similar in a similar way they discuss with other ransomware operators. For example, with Black Hat. Uh, recently, Black Hat was taken down, and there was an interesting discussion on XSS from Logbit to Black Hat, where they mentioned that uh, anyone who was impacted from Black Hat, they're free to send them a message and discuss about their future endeavors. Other than that, on the RAM forums, they allow uh, discuss- discussions and. Uh, but they allow a bit more freedom in terms of ransomware just because they are they are a smaller forum and they're looking to attract more hackers because it's a it's 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 a it's a very well rewarding business they, there's money to be made and with smaller forums there is some flexibility while on the exploit and xss they were a bit afraid of law enforcement so they wouldn't want to risk such a large community to be taken down by law enforcement just because uh, they're discussing and uh, actively advertising the ransomware. With Ramp, this risk is much smaller because the community is much smaller. And even if they get taken down, they'll quickly spread to other forums. So, yeah, it's just a matter of risk versus what you lose in case of law enforcement taking you down. So that's why ransomware is banned on some forums because it's too hot a topic, effectively, that there's too much law enforcement focus on it. Interesting. Exactly. Joe, is there something you wanted to comment on? For the work that I've done, you know, we we've seen examples of ransomware groups actually bidding for access on initial access broker posts on forums and things like that. So, you know, an initial access broker post is can be wildly valuable, you know, on that kind of community and wildly damaging to people like us. But I've also seen, I guess it could almost be called like PR work kind of being done by the ransomware groups. You know, a, a lot of the ransomware groups, similar to the access brokers, depend on their reputation. You know, if they've got a reputation for taking money and, and not decrypting their victims or, you know, overstating, you know, kind of the access they've got and, and the ransom that they've done, that's essentially going to destroy their reputation and make it a lot more difficult for that group to make money. So you quite often see posts around, you know, this ransomware group bragging about a new version of their encryptor, that sort of thing, you know, a particular win or success. It's all about building their kind of profile online. Yeah, we we've discussed that we discussed this a little bit more actually on the on the ransomware episode. We have too this slightly paradoxical situation that ransomware groups have, where they seem to be very focused on their publicity, while at the same time, obviously, using the dark web to to mask their activities. But it is it is a fascinating topic. We've mentioned, I guess, one way that security professionals can can use forums monitoring initial access broker posts. For example, they could identify that they they are being targeted. Uh, it's probably something worth doing. I guess maybe just to wrap up, I, I might ask each of you, what other intelligence can security professionals gather by mon- monitoring forums? What can they learn about the cyber criminal community from keeping an eye? And and would, is that something you would recommend that organizations do to, to keep an eye on what's happening on hacking forums? I'll start with you, Vlad. 
I think it's very important to not only monitor for specific incidents, but also monitoring for trends and monitoring for methods and keeping up to date with everything that comes to the actors' TTPs. So it's okay. Probably your company is not going to get targeted because you have a lot of security measures in place and so on. But you have to make sure that it doesn't have the this, your security measures aren't obsolete in let's say six months you have to keep on updating and updating everything to make sure that you keep up to speed with uh, to, with the actors ttps and by ttps i mean techniques technique tactics and procedures so it's uh it's as i said earlier it's a matter of a uh, game of cat and mouse uh you have to be faster than them you have to keep up to, with them because you never know when they find that new very interesting method of uh, getting a foothold into into your network uh, also, actors, they quite often, they speak, they discuss uh, and sell uh, information about vulnerabilities and methods on how to exploit CVEs and so on. And it's a, it's a very good method for you as a security practitioner and uh, information technology department member to make sure that those CVEs that are discussed, they do not impact. They're not about software that you use on your platform and resources and services because yeah, as I said, it's not necessarily your fault if a software is vulnerable to something, but you have to to make sure that you you secure it if the discussions about it arise on on forums. Yeah, and, and I think something we talk about sometimes is there are obviously a huge amount of vulnerabilities and a problem for organizations is how you prioritize patching. But for example, if you look at hacking forums and see a particular vulnerability is being much discussed, and like you say maybe information is being shared on techniques for exploiting it, you could maybe make a, a, a good decision to prioritize that patch. So effectively, you're using the resources that criminals learn to train themselves to to understand how you, know, you could protect yourself as well. I don't know if there's anything you'd, you'd add on, on that, Joe. What, what else can people learn from these, these monitoring these forums? No, I mean, you made the exact point that I was going to do around that prioritization. Um, you know, yes, you can use forums to look for dark web threats towards yourselves. Yes, you should absolutely be using forums to understand, you know, what actors are doing and where and so on. But, you know, every organization only has so much budget, so much manpower. You know, so if you if you rewind to last year when that Citrix Bleed sort of vulnerability came out, you know, within just a couple of days of that vulnerability being announced, there was exploit code freely being discussed and shared and promoted on a number of forums. You know, if you had two or three IT projects projects on the go for that particular time, if you see something like that that is wildly exploited, has a massive risk to your infrastructure, and it's so easy to do based on what you can see, you know, it's quite clear that you need to prioritize that. Brilliant. Well, that seems like a good note to draw a line under this episode of The Dark Dive. A big thank you to Vlad and Joe for joining me. And if you can't wait to find out more, remember you can follow us for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and whatever podcast app you have on your device and get all of the episodes of this limited series in your podcast feed now. If you'd like to get in touch with us here at Searchlight Cyber, you can find our social media accounts and our email address in the show notes. Or you can find plenty of information on our website, www.slcyber.io. Until next time, stay safe.